Hi there, Agile friends. Get ready for the World Tour of Agile at the Agile Online Summit 2023. You can join us from October 24th to 26th for a global showcase of cutting edge Agile practices and insights. Join us at agileonlinesummit.com. This year, we will be featuring some of the best work done around the world and world-class keynotes. You can check all of that at agileonlinesummit.com. But the best part is that your ticket is on us. That's right, it's free to attend and immerse yourself in the world of agile excellence. Don't miss out on this opportunity to level up your skills and network with peers and industry experts. Mark your calendars and secure your spot at AOS 23 today by visiting agileonlinesummit.com. So get your free ticket or opt for the full digital pass that lets you keep all the conference videos forever and organize, why not, Agile learning sessions at work. You can get the full digital access at agileonlinesummit.com. I'll see you in the conference floor. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special bonus episode uh, today on a very interesting topic, I'm sure, for many of you. But before we go any further, let's uh, welcome our guest, Douglas Squirrel. All of you will know him as Squirrel. Hey, Squirrel. Welcome to the Hello. show. Nice to be back again. Absolutely. We had Squirrel with Fred uh, back it's then. It's Jeffrey, actually. Jeffrey is sorry, my co-author. Sorry, Jeffrey. Apologies. He has two first names. It's just designed to confuse people. And then I blow them away with my name. <laughs> yeah, Squirrel will definitely create an impression. Uh, uh, with Jeffrey, and I'll I put the link on the, the show notes to talk about uh, the... Uh, so that you can go and listen to that episode. And we are here to talk about the cost of outsourcing. So when we were preparing this episode, Squirrel, uh, you made a statement that deserves some attention. Uh, you said moving engineers overseas does not reduce costs, it just shifts them. So walk us through your thinking. What does that mean? Absolutely. Well, let me tell you a story. So I'm a consultant, as you said, and I, I work with clients around the world. And um, although I live in England in a 600-year-old 60, house, I, I get to visit the world on my screen. Uh, and so uh, one person who visited my screen uh, was visiting from Los Angeles. And, and she said, Squirrel, we, we've got two groups in our organization, two uh, tech teams. One is onshore here in the United States, and one is in India. And they came to us through acquisition. So we, we had our own team, and then we acquired a company with the team in India. And gosh, that team in India has a quarter of the salaries. It's amazing. So um, uh, I'm thinking of moving everybody to India. Why, why are we paying these expensive engineers in the US uh, when uh, we, we have these great folks in India? And the, uh, uh, what do you think about that? And um, because I'm advising her, I have to come up with a, an answer for her. But I, I wanted to think with her more about the, the real costs and, and how that actually stacked up. So I said, uh, well, let's think about what the actual inputs are and the outputs. So um, which team is more productive for you? Which did, did gets more results for you? And she said, actually, Squirrel, the reason we're talking to you is neither of them is very productive. So we, we need really some help on both. And I said, okay, that, that's good to know. But um, uh, uh, which one has more management activity? Which one do you have to do more with um, in order to get the sort of anemic results you're currently getting. And she says, well, uh, uh, this um, team in India does actually require more management. And uh, we we have to um, supervise them more. We have to give them more precise instructions. Um, they seem to have a lot more back and forth with us. And as I dug into it a bit more, of course, the time zone difference between Los Angeles and India is pretty huge. And um, if you look at the costs of that, where you have to send a message and then wait for the reply and so on, it's almost like talking one, to the one moon. entire twenty-four hour cycle for exactly. One it's question. like well, it, you know, I, I was about to say it's like talking to the moon. It's more like talking to Mars, right? You have to send the message and then wait um, uh, long enough. That's why they can't drive the rover around at um, uh, the way you drive a car on Earth. They they have to figure out all the things that could happen to the rover, give it instructions, and then wait twenty-four minutes or whatever it is for the the, the signal to come back to say, oh. Yeah, I got stuck in the sand. So the same kind of thing happens with this um, very distant overseas team. So when we added up the costs, uh, 
what we saw was that uh, that it's actually not that much less expensive for the Indian folks, and that's what led to this. Can, can you walk us through some on. of those costs? Because I, I, sure. I've I've heard this argument. Indeed, I have made this argument myself mm -hmm. uh, regarding some other big company which had uh, similar time zone difference and and was trying to reduce costs. Uh, I'm doing air quotes here. Reduce yes, yes. costs by putting more people in in a country where the salaries were cheaper. But uh, mm -hmm. what, what kind of costs did you come up with? So we have one obvious, which you already mentioned, which is management overhead. Okay, so that's one. Yep. What are the others? Well, delivery speed is is one that um, just because you have this kind of time delay, it's like the the you know how many light minutes away the the, the Mars is from Earth. You, you have um, a, a natural delay in how quickly you can make changes. Now it's obfuscated in this specific example because neither team was doing this very well, and I was able to help them with moving faster in, in, in both teams. But there's a natural limitation on how much you can do with a team that has such a long communication cycle. And, and I often teach teams to deliver every single day, and you might be able to get the Indian team to deliver every single day, but it's gonna be with a delay. It's going to be just like the rover can drive at normal speed, um, but we don't drive it at normal speed because, gosh, if we did, it might crash into a ditch and we wouldn't know for half an hour. And that could be a big problem. So similarly, um, what we found was that we couldn't get the Indian team to, to be as reactive, to be as um, responsive to customers. And, and that's a significant challenge. And how about the communication between product owner or product manager, if that's the role they had and the team? Like, how did that work? Uh, but not very good. So um, that what you can have and, and what they tried to do was to have someone local to the outsourced team. Uh, but the problem is that person then isn't local to the local people. So um, the, the uh, particular industry this company's in is is uh, has a uh, some geographic limitations, kind of headquartered in in their uh, in their region in California, and so uh, people in India don't necessarily have the same understanding and the same contacts and the same understanding of customers. Now you can get on the phone to them, but wait a minute, now we're back to the Martian problem, where right? we have the, the the time zone difference that makes it difficult to to have the back and forth with customers. So of course the other solution to that is put the product managers locally so they can talk to the customers, but then they have the communication challenge to the outsourced team. Um, of course, one solution to this is put people on planes a lot. Gosh, that's another cost, right? So they're going back and forth to India, which is another thing this company did as well, is to um, do, do a lot of back and forth uh, for one particular person who was a leader of the team and spent a good amount of time in Los Angeles. Uh, but that began to become expensive, not only in terms of uh, actual flights, but his time, his attention, and you know, you're tired when you get to the other place and so on. So you can't be as effective. So all these costs start to mount up. Um, but there's another important one we haven't got to. Do you mind if I move on to yet another cost? So um, that is uh, the seniority that you need. So uh, what I find is that um, teams sometimes try to make an optimization in two different directions. And these two directions are, are not, not a good, it's not good to do both. So they'll say, let's get some more junior people. What we've kind of mastered our technology now, we kind of know what we need to do. And we can give more junior people some instructions. That's the smart ones. Of course, the, the less smart ones just say, I want less, exp less expense. My context is very complex. Nobody understands it. And I want junior people to run it. That does, that never works out no matter where you're going to do it. But sometimes they say, they're, they're smart about it. And they say, there's some areas of our code that are less complex. We've really mastered them. We can put junior people on it. And then they say, and we'll get junior people in this other country. And it'll be really cheap. And the problem is that um, there's an inverse relationship between distance and um, seniority needed. In other words, the farther away you get, the more senior people you need because they need to be more independent. And they need to be able to not ask as many questions because of this communication distance and cultural difference and cultural distance. They, they need more breadth so that they can say, you know, it may be that here in my country, we don't do this, but actually this other thing that I worked on 10 years ago, that's like what we're working on. So I now know what I can do, and I can take a reasonable guess while I wait for the product manager in the in the U.S. to wake up, for example. So um, what I often see in teams is that uh, they, uh, the smart ones anyway, find that uh, they need more seniority the farther away they go. And of course, more senior people are more expensive and harder to find. So you not only have um, greater salary cost, which kind of starts to eat into your supposed saving, uh, but also you have longer recruitment times. 
because it's harder to find the right people. And that was really particularly biting this uh, company that I'm using as my example here. They were saying, gosh, it, it's uh, in the US, we already have trouble finding the level of seniority we need. In India, it, it's an uh, equally long time, but we thought we were going to be saving money over there. In fact, we have these holes and we can't fill them. So that also increased their cost. And well, of course, the other aspect is that as we look for, uh, let's call it cheaper uh, locations in the globe to uh, offshore teams to, we're definitely not the only ones. And uh, certain cities around the world that are known for their uh, ability to provide software development teams are so crowded with other companies that it can become quite quickly even more expensive to have a senior person in those locations than it is to have in, in headquarters. Now, of course, there are countries that are a lot more expensive than others, and that will always be the case, right? It will take a long time before all of that equalizes. Um, so one of the questions that I have is, okay, so cost might not be a good idea to justify offshoring, but when you look at the teams that you have worked with, and some of them, I'm sure, have been successful despite offshoring. Oh, in, what, because what do you it, see? No, it goes stronger. Some of them are successful how, how because How do you see the, the patterns? What are the patterns that can actually work in yeah. offshoring? Here's the main one. If you're offshoring because it increases your capacity and your um, time to market, especially your time to get engineers in, in seats, then you're you have a much better reason your your thinking is much more on track and of course then you would not want to be in those very crowded locations you'd want to be in somewhat less crowded areas where the talent you need is available and it's the availability that's more important than the cost because you're going to pay that cost back right you're 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 going to shift that cost to a different uh locations can be a different place on your on your balance sheet as we just talked about but what can happen is you say, well, look, I'm struggling to hire in my locality. Wherever I am, that's crowded. There's a lot of people here. But man, it would be easier for me often even in the same country. So you don't have to go over uh, the ocean necessarily. But uh, even in my same country, there's a part of my country where there's a lot less uh, development competition. And this has been very successful uh, in a number of cases where um, for a number of reasons, the company has been able to accommodate special needs for individuals um, that make them want to be in another location. Now, often that's the cost of living and the style of living for those people. But it also is my parents are ill and they live in this relatively small town far away. And I have to live in the big city in order to make the big bucks uh, to um, uh, support them and, and uh, uh, support my family. So, uh, man, I can't see my parents very often. But you say, great, well, you go live with your parents and you be remote with us and come visit us in the big city periodically. And, and that uh, will allow, people will give you a big discount, well, significant discount anyway, on their um, income if it means they can be in a location that's important to them. And that can be parents, that can be sweethearts, that can be um, style of living, lots of other things. Um, I've had people who who say, look, I really like surfing. And, um, you know, I can't surf in London, but man, I sure can surf in Devon or I can surf in Hawaii or somewhere else. And uh, so I'll, I'll go and have my surfing activity uh, and um, I can uh, continue to work for you here in London. Um, and uh, it, where you can accommodate that for your existing people, that helps retain them and sometimes can reduce the cost with them. Uh, or the, you don't have to all of those are related to finding talent. So one one yes. good reason to offshore is to go where the talent is. Like for example, yes. or, or a lot to support of companies, the talent that you have to go to some place where they want to be. Keep going. Yeah, because otherwise they they might even leave the company, right? Exactly. I, yep. I remember that um, way back when I think it was 2012, 2013, when Nokia closed down. Mm. Uh, a lot of other companies moved to Helsinki and Tampere, the main areas where Nokia had of lots of engineers already located who suddenly now needed a different job. And yep. when you get people with a lot of experience, many of them very senior in a country that isn't even very expensive compared to others around, then that's a that's a win-win, right? Like when you look at the overall context. But there are also patterns in terms of organizing teams. So what are some of the patterns that you've seen work well when it comes to offshoring and organizing the teams for successful offshoring? 
Yeah, well, one of the most important ones is is one we've talked about before, and it it's one of those that falls in the category of, gee, this is a good idea, and it, it's a good idea in any organization, but man, it's an even better good idea. It pays off a lot more when some of your folks or all of your folks are remote, and, and that's the idea of cross-functional teams, or, or my preferred term, which is feature teams, and, and you can read about this concept of feature teams at featureteams.org. Um, there's a couple different definitions floating around of this term, but I mean the one that's defined there and which I'm about to define. And, and a feature team is one which can work on any feature. That's really its main characteristic. And so that means you do not have the mobile team and the back end team and the data team and the something else. Because I was just doing an evaluation of a, an organization that is uh, mired in this um, kind of endless handoff process. And, and they're not that remote. <laughs> They've got a few people scattered around the UK, but they haven't got people around the world. Uh, and they are still finding that, um, that, uh, that in the past quarter, in the um, uh, quarter that just finished, they had 15 different tasks they were trying to complete and they got zero of them done. Because for each one, for a different reason, it was all different uh, 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 stories about how it happened. But for each one, there was a team that was uh, waiting to hand off to somebody else and the handoff got dropped or they didn't know about it or they didn't get it done. And so the whole thing couldn't get to customers because part of it was done, but the other part wasn't finished. And, and this just gets about a thousand times worse when these people are on different continents and you have the Martian communication problem again, because uh, it's much easier to drop it. It's not like you just run into them in the hall or you poke them at the stand up or something because you're in the same time zone and you say, hey, wait a minute, you haven't built your piece, so we can't give this to customers. It doesn't happen as naturally. And so it becomes much easier, in fact, to wind up with this handoff hell if you have your uh, engineers uh, scattered in, in lots of different places. And it's not even very hard to find out if you are in that handoff hell. You just track the dependencies on any given team. And as they start to grow, you ask, why are those dependencies there? Can we get rid of them? Is there any way through architectural changes or team changes that we could remove those dependencies? But what, what I hear you say is where you have, uh, let's call them hard dependencies between teams, it's not a good idea to offshore, especially not if there's a lot of time zones in between the teams. You got it, because what you already have, which is the, the pain and extra cost of these hard dependencies, becomes magnified exponentially by the fact that people are far away. Whether they're in the same time zone or a different one, you don't have anything like the natural interactions that would trigger people to say, oh, yeah, I got to do that thing. I've got to make sure I work on this. Now, there's another pattern which people sometimes do. They, they say... Uh, what I'd like to do then is, okay, I got what you're saying, Squirrel. I understand that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have a feature team in Romania, and I'm going to have a feature team in Serbia, and I'm going to have a feature team in uh, Chicago. And um, uh, th those folks will all work on their individual features, and, and that'll be better. And, and they're right. That is better. But there's a problem with that, which is you don't get cross-seeding. You don't get information flowing. So you get them kind of drifting off in, in lots of different directions. You can wind up, in the worst case, with separate products that really don't work together and uh, don't work the same. So what is more successful, counterintuitively, is to have people in the remote location working with people in the local location on the same um, uh, feature team. Now, this is tremendously difficult but overcomable uh, if they are as distant as my um, Los Angeles and India example, because they're really opposite poles there, and, and it is really difficult to find overlap. But if you can persevere, if you can find ways for people to get up early and stay up late and um, to interact frequently and so on, do a lot of messaging and so on, there's, there's big overhead there, which is why you're not saving costs by doing it. But what you can find then is that you get a lot of cross seeding and you got a lot of helpful ideas passing from one to the other. The um, uh, kind of uh, polar opposite of this, the kind of um, worst case where, as you were saying, how would you know if you're in this situation? Uh, the worst case is one where you have this um, uh, distant team. Nobody ever really talks to them. They, they just really get some specifications from some product people and something comes back and it's usually not quite what you wanted and there's no feedback going to them. And, and when you have that, you might have all the, the, the required dependencies there. There might be no hard dependency um, uh, with them. So, so you have more productivity from them on what they're doing, but what they're doing is the wrong thing. 
because they haven't got that uh, uh, information passing back and forth. And one of the interventions I've often done in that situation is to say, okay, we're going to start having these teams cross over. We're going to have people that are in the different locations participating together. And when I see that, that's um, usually a much better sign. And, and I think that that brings us to one extreme case of what we have been just talking about, which is something that many organizations ended up faced with after the COVID pandemic, which is full remote. So, of course, it's hard enough, as uh, Squirrel, you just explained at the start of this episode, to have two teams in different parts of the globe. But what if now you have every team member on a different part of the globe? That's actually easier. So walk us through that. Yeah, because uh, then everybody's on the same page. And I remember reading about uh, Stack Overflow um, in its early days and some interesting cultural innovations they had, which at that time were really quite radical. Uh, we hadn't had a pandemic. We hadn't got on Zoom. You know, you and I have never met in person, Vasco, but uh, we're we're here chatting and we're, we're good friends. Um, th th that kind of thing didn't happen then. But what Stack Overflow did, because they were solving the talent problem by getting people from around the world uh, and, and being a, a developer platform that, that was particularly attractive for them. So they had people in practically every country. And uh, then they had a home office where there were lots of people uh, working um, there. And you get this disparity, which they didn't want to have between the kind of home office people who have the water cooler conversations and run into each other in the hall and the people in the distant places who get left out. So their innovation was to say every meeting and every conversation is online. And so if I were sitting next to you in the New York office, um, uh, working together at desks opposite each other, and we wanted to discuss something, we would go in a room, two different rooms, put on headphones and talk to each other. And what this forced them to do, of course, was to have really good headphones and really good computers and excellent bandwidth and other sorts of things. And it made sure it made it very easy for us to say, you know, our colleague in Brazil would really understand this. Let's get uh, her on the line. And then they'd beep, beep, beep. And the Brazil person would jump in and they would not be disadvantaged at that Brazil person because we're already online. It's not like, oh, yeah, we'll have to tell them about the meeting afterwards. Let's bring I, I remember right I remember one time um, we had a problem similar to that, not, not necessarily everybody remote, but the team was split into two different locations. And the team themselves came up with the idea that, okay, so whenever we are discussing something that has to do with architecture, we will do it together. But how do we do mm -hmm. it together? Because you don't necessarily want to interrupt people. So how do you uh, emulate this osmotic communication that happens when you overhear something. So what we ended up doing, and, and they came up with the idea, was to have an always on Google Meet yep. and a, uh, a camera and a, a very good conference microphone in both rooms, right? Yep. Like they were the, the, the team, the portion of the team which was remote, and then there was the portion of the team that was at headquarters. And they always had the mic and the camera on but the person on the other side had the opportunity to allow the uh, sound to come in by looking at the video, right? If, mm -hmm. if the video feed shows that people are gathering around the microphone, you want to put up, uh, put on the sound and sure. listen to what they sound, are of course. talking about. And what happened was uh, what I call a, a Star Trek moment where we were just having an architectural discussion around the conference phone as we had agreed. And suddenly a voice comes up and starts talking to us. And what, what, what just happened? Where'd and it was a from? colleague in the offshore office who had seen us gather around the microphone, put the sound on, started listening and said, hey, guys, I actually have a solution for that. Right. Excellent. Yeah. And, and these are simple patterns. They are not necessarily cheap to implement because you do need good uh, hardware, but they are simple patterns that allow offshoring to be potentially successful by creating this something we already know works in practice, which is this opportunity for osmotic communication. Absolutely. So, so let me come back to your original question, which was, how do you handle this when it's fully remote? And I said it was easier. It's easier because you're forced to do these things. And um, you, you, you're forced to have some equivalent of the window. Um, I've had that in a number of organizations where somebody would just turn on a screen and it's there all the time. And you could walk up and you could almost tap on the screen and say, hey, Vasco, uh, can you talk to me for a minute? Uh, so that works really well. 
but you're kind of forced to have that. Um, it's not an option when you're fully remote. You have to have these um, uh, um, opportunities for interaction, and uh, the, the team kind of naturally evolve them. You can improve them. You can make them better, but um, you're forced to do it, and that's actually better and easier. So I actually find my um, fully remote clients are better at this. They have they have less um, uh, improvement to make than the ones who are uh, kind of have a, still have a home office and lots of people there and a bunch of people at home and they're trying to make that work uh, because uh, it's much e much harder to make that shift. Absolutely. So uh, Squirrel, we're getting close to the end. Uh, I don't know if you have any other story to share before we close, but uh, as you think about the story, we would like you to give us a resource. Could be a blog, a video, a podcast, a book that helps us understand these patterns, the patterns that work for nearshoring, offshoring, or fully remote, as you, we were just discussing. Uh, what could you recommend for those of us who want to go deeper into the topic? Oh, fascinating. Um, I don't know that I know a lot of great resources on it. Um, there are some really good old Stack Overflow blog posts that describe this uh, mechanism they used, and too, too many folks are not even now doing this, this is 10 years old now, um, but uh, many folks are are not doing uh, the, making the kinds of adjustments to uh, the, the online world that we really all now live in. Uh, so, so those are still worth reading. Um, if people want me to help them find these, by the way, uh, feel free to get in touch with me. Just look at uh, douglassquirrel.com and you'll find all my information, my community and lots of other things that are going on there. So um, yeah, I, I don't have links for you to stick in the show notes, but just stick that one in and I'll, I'll help people if they're interested in getting in touch uh, to find them. So Stack Overflow blog is one. I mean, the the, the now classic text is uh, Team Topologies, which came out at the same time as Jeffrey in my book. So we, we ran into each other on the virtual book tours, which was fun. Um, uh, but of course, that has a lot on uh, shapes of teams. Um, FeatureTeams.org, I mentioned as a description, a bright, brief and clear description of the these cross-functional uh, organizations. Do I know any others? I had another. Oh, now there's one. I, I just can't think of the name of it. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't come with it in my mind. But there there's one I know of, and I think there are more like it, um, which provide uh, are tools which provide a kind of online office environment that sort of try to recreate the running into people experience. So it's much more than Slack rooms where it's kind of everyone shouting. Um, there's uh, the one I have in mind has kind of virtual rooms you can go into and you can go in a quiet room and no one will bother you. And you can go into a architecture room and then you're prompted for discussions about architecture and there's a whiteboard there and there's some. Um, uh, a lot of innovation in this area. I mean, we're all going to have um, what is it? Uh, the the new Google virtual reality glasses in in a few years, and and we'll all be walking around in virtual space. I predict. But um, until that comes, there are some two dimensional versions of this. And I'm sorry, I just can't think of the name. Uh, there's but, at uh, least some Coco. Uh, that's the one. That's the one. I'll put I think that we, on the show notes for sure. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't remember the name, but there are others. I don't want to say that's the only one. There may be better ones. Um, but I know we tried that at a conference. I think it might be a conference that, that you go to too, Vasco. Um, uh, we tried it and it was a, a very interesting experiment. So those kinds of tools are worth keeping touch with. Uh, they may or may not work for you, but um, uh, I think there's lots coming in that direction, which can help bridge this um, kind of Earth to Mars uh, communication gap. Absolutely. And it is all about creating those opportunities for communication to flow as close to co-location as, as possible, given the, the, the constraints. Or, or even better. And that was the Stack Overflow insight was, you know, if we could do better than by being in person, let's do that. Absolutely. We'll put the link to the Stack Overflow blog. And if you find some of those blog posts, happy to put those there. Otherwise, check out DouglasSquirrel.com. I'll put the link to that also on the show notes and, and get in touch with Douglas, uh, so Squirrel, where can people find out more about you and uh, the work that you're doing? Yeah, best places are DouglasSquirrel.com, as we mentioned already, and SquirrelSquadron.com, which is where I have my community of thousands of executives from around the country, uh, from around the world, sorry, uh, who are uh, both tech and non-tech working together. So uh, we're solving problems like remote work and um, the, the advent of AI and uh, figuring out how on earth to release our software every day instead of every six months. Uh, we're working on all of those kinds of things together. So uh, love to hear from people on either DouglasSquirrel.com for me personally, or Squirrel Squadron for the community. Absolutely. Squirrel, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your generosity with your time and your knowledge. Oh, always happy, Vasco, and happy to come back again anytime. 
We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.